Maybe we'll start with you directly, uh, Mr. Rotka. A lot of questions came in actually in the meanwhile. Uh, I don't know if it's possible for German Chamber to switch back to this military slide. So the question was that 400 liters of methanol are able to replace 9,000 liters of diesel. Was that a typo? Sorry, this wasn't a typo. This is actually true. Um, to be fair, these numbers consist of all uh, costs to, um, in general, which are mainly logistic costs and acquisition costs for the diesel. But this is actually the true, um, the true, uh, those are the true numbers. You can check them via our Indian partner, F, uh, uh, FC Technology. Okay. Um, then there was a, let's rush quick to some questions. There was a question on uh, your uh, standby capabilities. So is it possible, uh, uh, Rohit, for example, to uh, just leave the uh, electrolyzer idle or does it always has to run? Does it always um, uh, have to have some minimum output production um, uh, so that the cells don't go bad or uh, can you just switch the system off and then turn it on again whenever you want? No, you can completely switch it off when you turn it on whenever you want. In fact, some of the solar applications like uh, summer energy storage you will most likely produce in the summer and not really need the electrolyzer in the winter. So this is not an issue at all with our technology. Uh, Mr. Rucker, your systems also just like switch on, switch off or do you uh, usually uh, have them in standby mode and they require a minimum uh, uh, running um, with uh, some minimum input of power? Actually, yes, they require some minimum of power um, to, char uh, to start the chemical process in the fuel cell, but this is below 1.0.1 uh, ampere, um, but it uh, requires a battery um, to start this process. Um, but then the fuel cell runs completely in uh, in uh, automatic mode, which means they monitor the status of the battery completely uh, alone and then uh, switch on and switch off whenever uh, power is needed. So okay, the, the battery never never goes into the into the deep uh, deep discharge uh, mode. Okay. Then there had been uh, thank you. Then there had been some question in regards to safety. Both of you uh, have presented uh, that there is possibilities to integrate it into the building. Uh, Mr. Rucker, you said the hydrogen itself uh, is stored outside. Maybe the question to you, uh, Julius von der Ohr, is it legal in German? Uh, to have uh, these kind of systems in the houses? I guess yes, else they wouldn't be offered. But yeah, what are the minimum requirements? So hydrogen has to be stored outside or is it even possible to uh, have hydrogen storage inside a building? Maybe you can shed some more light on this. So yeah, I guess uh, the, one of the biggest selling uh, points uh, is that you can in fact store um, the, place the whole system inside of your home. Uh, depending on the type of storage, of course, the, the details may vary. Uh, when people talk about hydrogen storage, uh, in terms of mobile applications, you get storage up to 700 bars. This is not the case uh, for, for the stationary type of applications where you have gas bundles of the 200 bar bottles or even lower pressure uh, gas tanks uh, of, of stainless steel of say in the range to up to 50 bars and, and I guess all manufacturers are, have, have a very strong interest to, to make the, the safety requirements, to meet the safety requirements and to, to see that they in fact can install and integrate these systems in, in housing applications with the lowest additional, uh, yeah. Adaptions. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, 
maybe Rohiji, so uh, you said, yeah, also in the basement, but uh, you would always, I mean, you're not, you're offering the electrolyzer, no? So you work together with the system integrators, but uh, like from your experience, uh, usually uh, hydrogen storage itself was always outside the building, or can you maybe shed some light on it? In general, yes, because the hydrogen storage, I'll give you an example of home power solutions. Uh, of course, they use our electrolyzers, but they have their own concepts for safety, etc. If you can see on their website, you'll see that the, uh, the storage mechanism, the tanks are usually installed outside, but the electrolyzer and the fuel cell itself is installed inside in a cabinet with the proper ventilation, etc. So that's not too much of an issue. And as Julius was saying before, there are different kinds of storage technologies as well. So low pressure storage and metal hydrides, which is being used by another partner of ours in Australia, Lavo. And uh, we'll have to check this on, from their information, but I think those are even uh, easier to store inside, potentially. And I guess, Mr. Roka, methanol is uh, not an issue at all. Uh, most of the systems you have showed uh, were methanol systems. So their uh, storage inside the building isn't an issue at all, I guess. No, absolutely, absolutely not. Um, it's a matter, a matter of fact that most of the most of our applications are are outdoor um, applications. But it would be perfectly safe to store uh, the methanol inside um, by ensuring a small uh, a small capacity of ventilation because um, one of the uh, byproducts are, of course, um, CO2, but not more than a child's breath. I would, um, uh, I would make the, the comparison here. Um, and of course, uh, a little bit of water. This is the, um, but that's all. If you can deal with it according to um, local um, and, uh, public safety uh, instructions, it's perfectly fine for indoor. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, we have a couple of seconds left, so maybe uh, one more question in terms of the size. Definitely that depends on what kind of system we are talking about, but since uh, the idea here in India is to mainly replace diesel gen sets, uh, one has to say that maybe a diesel gen set for a three-story uh, three building would have something in between, yeah, even 50 to 100 kilowatt, no? So uh, that's quite a diesel gen set already. And uh, the question would be, how big would such a system be? Uh, would it be maybe three, four times the size of a, of a diesel gen set? Definitely that depends a lot of also on the storage, but maybe you can, because the photo you have showed, for example, Mr. Roca now on this microgrid system, you said, I think this is a uh, only 100 or 200 watt system, no? So uh, quite small. So how big is it going to be if we are actually talking about 50 kilowatt, for example? Rohit, Mr. Ruka. I can right. answer. I can only answer from the electrolyzer side, you know, so as we showed in our presentation there, we are building one module. It's 2.4 kilowatts, produces one kilogram hydrogen. You can have 10 or 15 or 20 of these modules. It doesn't really matter for us. And I think a similar answer will come also from our colleague Christian. These are modular and scalable building blocks. You can start with two kilowatts, upgrade to 10 or 100 and so on. Also have a project phase that makes more commercial sense in some cases. Yeah, maybe you don't want to replace 200 kilowatts immediately, but uh, the option to do this is there, yes. Well, I can I can say similar similar things for for the fuel cell. Um, if you take one one hydrogen fuel cell of us produces 2.5 kilowatt um, of power, and it's scalable and um, integratable into into other sources of power too. So of course, um, up to a certain power demand, it's getting difficult to um, only to um, to do it by by hydrogen, but this is limited to the storage capacity, not to the production cap uh, capacity itself. For example, if you use um, up to 100 kilowatt um, of hydrogen um, uh, cylinders, they are usually it is usually stored uh, in Germany up to 300 bar. Um, 
it will be yeah phew, around uh, more than 50 cylinders so this is uh, this is quite a number and um, at some point you have to think about where is the logistical effort here um, where and where is it not so um, up to some point it makes sense to um, to have a standalone um, solution with users but uh, after a certain point it makes sense to integrate them into into microgrids with solar power and so on and to talking about yeah please you, you just, just one please. additional comment uh, because when when you you start from the perspective of diesel gensets right you you ask for power requirements that are basically due to the fact that diesel gensets are the the the, the technology uh, that is available right if you're now talking and switching to to fuel cells that are necessarily combined for adjusting the flexible loads with batteries you have two technologies that can vary and and complement each other in in size so depending on what kind of load profiles if you talk about say once a year the power requirements of a peak load of 100 kilowatts the total system would scale completely different if you talk about compared to uh, the option when you talk about 100 kilowatts continuous operation so depending on your load profile and requirements uh, the technology and the scaling of the their respective components of battery and fuel cells may vary and uh, therefore it's it's not easy to give a very straightforward short answer no no that is clear that is clear but uh, yeah, one uh, uh, participant asked you know, that they have actually peak load requirement of uh, 40 kilowatt because in the uh, uh, hot summers in India, you know, when everybody turns on the AC and each AC uh, uh, you know, requires around 2000 watts and you multiply this with a three story building and uh, you get the 40 uh, kilowatt power demand very quick. Unfortunately, this is then when the power grid sometimes fails. And this is where some people were thinking of uh, replacing it maybe by a hydrogen system. So yeah, this was uh, the originator of the question. But uh, yes, we understand that the, right now there is a lot of niche markets uh, where your systems are being deployed. But maybe as a final uh, remark from everyone, because we close, uh, where do you see uh, the future of uh, your product and uh, your business? Will it remain a niche product for specific customer requirements? Or are you even believing that this might even uh, compete with battery? Or is it more like Mr. Ohr said, uh, a complementary uh, to battery? Maybe one final uh, comment from each uh, one of you. And uh, for our audience, thank you very much for having taken your time to participate in the, today's webinar. All the uh, presenters have agreed to share their presentations. You'll find a lot more links you might have seen in the presentations, which are clickable to get more information. And with this uh, final comment uh, from your side, Mr. Rocker. Thank you. Then I will start. Um, I can only agree totally with uh, Mr. Van der Hohe. Um, the main, the main benefit here lies in uh, uh, combining fuel cell technology with the battery technology. So we're not trying to replacing it, but to make it even better. And if you're speaking of peak loads of 40 kilowatts and and so on, it is possible, but it has to be provided by batteries. Um, but the fuel cells ensure that these batteries will never run out of power. So I think this is not uh, this an application for the broader market, but every solution is tailored, of course, and every requirement must be, um, must be analyzed um, very carefully. That's for sure. Thank you, wonderful statement, Rohiji. Well, the answer is a little bit easier for us. We just make uh, little machines that make hydrogen. And hydrogen is not a niche market. Hydrogen is a technical gas that has been used for decades and decades. The only thing that we are doing now is making that hydrogen green. 
So uh, yeah, 10,000 modules in a month being produced in 2023. Uh, it's definitely not a niche market for us. Thank you so much. Julius. Uh, yeah, thanks. Um, I think it's yeah, my, my position uh, to, to link it back to the, the big uh, scheme right, of things. And uh, I think when it comes to hydrogen and fuel cell technologies for stationary applications, we will definitely start in niche applications, um, but I'm interested to see how far it goes. We are in a, in a total uh, scheme of things where we see a transition from an OPEX-based uh, economy to more CAPEX-based systems, uh, right? The main investment for, for solar, for fuel cell, for these uh, technologies is in the investment and depending on what how successful and after and how successful sfc is in scaling up the technologies uh, we might as well see uh, fuel cells in a broader applications for uh, stationary applications replacing diesel gen sets altogether that being said of course always in combination with battery storage uh, so it's not a either or uh, but uh, a joint partnership of these clean technologies that help the, uh, the, the energy transition altogether. Thank you very much, Mr. Van der Oer, Julius. Uh, thank you, Rohit Prasadji, uh, Christian Roca. Thank you very much for having taken your time. Thank you very much to uh, the Indo-German Chamber of Commerce who has organized uh, today's webinar. Thank you very much to the colleagues from the Indo-German Energy Forum for their support. And thank you very much to you, dear participants, for having taken out your time to get a little bit more an insight uh, into the topic of uh, a small-scale uh, uh, electrolyzer being able to be upscaled up to megawatts. Looking forward to uh, 400 megawatt capacity per year, you were saying, Luigi? Well, we start with 300 to us and then maybe 400 after that. Okay, okay. So uh, that sounds uh, quite encouraging. Looking definitely forward to it. Who is interested in um, more megawatt scale electrolyzer uh, technology and hydrogen uh, production? Indo German Chamber of Commerce and uh, Indo German uh, Energy Forum will offer another webinar uh, pretty soon. So just like uh, uh, follow us on uh, at IGFSO uh, on the Twitter um, channel and uh, yeah, keep subscribed to uh, the channels uh, of the Indo-German Chamber of Commerce. And as said earlier, we'll share all the presentations with you. And uh, with this, I wish you a wonderful uh, rest of the week and Firmelenge. Uh, Firmelenge, thank you.